of three monetary values. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation also to speak at this virtual string now. So, as you said, I will deal with quantum modularity of certain free manifolds and variants. And I can just a second. <laughs> the talk is based on the different works, mainly the 3D modularity paper, a uh, work made in collaboration with uh, Chang, Chun, Gukov, and Harrison. And uh, also other works with uh, Gabriele Sgoi. And at the end, uh, I will also mention uh, um, the work in progress with Pavel Putrov uh, that he already discussed yesterday. So I will just briefly um, describe a few other uh, features uh, of the uh, free manifolds invariants we are considering. So this work uh, relies on the interplay of uh, different branches of mathematics, number theory, where quantum modular forms arise and also other objects I will describe during my talk. Um, low dimensional topology, uh, free manifolds, and in particular, free manifolds invariants for um, closed, uh, I will just consider closed connected free manifolds, uh, plumbed free manifolds. And the physics that is rooted in the 3D free d correspondence, and in particular, it describes different 3D theories um, topological 3D theories, uh, so John Simon's theory on one side, and supersymmetric uh, 3D n equal to 2 theories that I'll describe later. Um, mainly, I will describe two invariants, WRT invariants, and the recently introduced uh, homological blocks. And, and at the end, uh, I will uh, quickly mention uh, a few other invariants that seem to have also quantum modular properties. So I'll start with a description of um, modular forms uh, to introduce then the strong quantum modular forms and highlight the difference and similarities uh, they have. Then I'll go to, into the topology side and describe the three manifolds I'll be considering, WRT invariants and homological blocks, as I already mentioned. So let me start by defining a modular form. As you probably all know, a modular form phi of weight k in which we system phi with respect to a group gamma, uh, that can be a discrete subgroup of SL2R, is a holomorphic function phi defined from the upper half plane to the complex plane, which satisfies the functional equation written below. Uh, where I used the notation of the slash operator, in particular the weight k slash operator, which is defined uh, here. And where, as usual, the action of gamma on H is given by fractional linear transformation. And from the practically all the talk, I will just uh, take gamma to be SL2Z. Uh, another uh, thing I will use is what I call cast form, which is basically a modular form uh, whose Fourier expansion takes this form. And so it starts from uh, positive integer uh, n. And q will be e to the 2 pi i tau, where tau is the object that lives in the upper half plane. Now, uh, quantum modular forms have been defined by Zaguer in 2010, and even earlier in a paper with uh, Lawrence. Um, and they have a particular features. As I mentioned here, they're not, they're defined at the boundary of the upper half plane. So, instead of being defined on the upper half plane as usual modular forms, they, takes the, they are only defined from the, fra, the, from the rational and I infinity, so the cusps of the upper half plane. Moreover, um, they're, ne they're analytic nor gamma covariant functions. Why this is the case, basically, uh, since they're defined on the boundary of the upper half plane, the Topology that they inherit from the action of gamma on the upper half plane is a discrete topology. So uh, any form of analyticity or continuity will be vacuous. And moreover, they cannot be an uh, invariant function under the action of uh, group gamma. Otherwise, if they would be, they would basically be a trivial functions since uh, gamma acts on the cusps with um, finitely many orbits. And if you require covariancy under the action of gamma, you will 
mathematically obtain a trivial function. So here you can see the difference uh, between quantum modular forms and modular forms. However, what he required in his definition is that the failure of his analyticity actually is a mm, offset in a sense by the modularity. And what I mean by that is that, so a quantum modular form of weight k and multiplier chi with respect to gamma is a function from q to c, or if you want p1, q to c, such that every gamma, for every gamma, this function p gamma x has a better analytic behavior than qx. So if you take the original uh, q, the quantum modular form in x and subtract the modular transformed quantum modular form, what you obtain is a function that has some property of analyticity. And moreover, it's a, it's a co-cycle on gamma. Uh, for all the cases that I considered in this talk, actually p gamma, this uh, period, also called period function, uh, is a real analytic function on p1r minus a finite subset of points. And um, I will also um, just restrict it to what are usually uh, known as stronger quantum modular form. Uh, which in this case is a function q, q, which associates to each element x a formal power series over c. So that this identity actually holds between countable collection of formal power series. And again, all the examples that I uh, considered below, uh, I do not only associate a power series, but I can actually define a function q, which extends globally uh, to the whole complex plane minus the real line, but plus all the rational numbers. So in particular, you can imagine it as a function defining the upper half plane that leaks through the rationals into the lower half plane. And given this definition, you can see that um, there is a lot of ambiguity in extending this function from the real line, or actually from the rationals, to values in the upper and in the lower half plane. And we'll see how it, this ambiguity will play a role later. But first, let me describe you the first, w, the first three manifolds invariants we consider, usually known as Witten or Shetekin to derived invariant. And it is defined as the partition functions of Stern Simon's theory uh, on the three manifold M3. And here I'll just uh, restrict to the gauge group SU2. Uh, it is defined more generally, but for my thoughts, uh, this is what's sufficient at the moment. And uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, the level, this makes sense. There is a consistency quantization condition uh, for K and integer. However, thanks to Rashetekin and to Rive that defines these objects combinator combinatorically using uh, uh, representation theory of the quantum groups UQSL2, this uh, definition actually extends to a function from the rational numbers. So instead of being a function of 1 over k, where k is an integer, uh, it makes sense at any rational number point to a complex number. And moreover, you can even associate uh, an asymptotic series that corresponds to the perturbative expansions around one over k at a certain saddle and uh, one over k for k that goes to infinity. So this object was proven to be a topological invariant. And moreover, it was shown uh, to be an example of strong quantum modular form by Lawrence Hansagel. A new homological invariant came into play um, a few years ago, uh, it was defined by group of Pate, Boutrov, and Bafa in 2017. And the idea is uh, rooted in the, this class, this finite class of 60n equal to 2 comma 0 theory, where I will just mention the A1 case, uh, labeled by this Lie algebra, on M3 times D2 times S1. Basically, compatifying this, theor this theory uh, on different uh, manifolds, I will obtain either a topological quantum field theory. Here, I'm going very quickly, uh, but just to give you a flavor of what's going on. Um, 
so I will get either a topological uh, field theory, which is actually uh, analytically continued free Duchenne Simons theory on M3 when I compatify on D2 times S1, or uh, a supersymmetric uh, uh, three dimensional gauge theory, okay, 3D n equal to 2 theory. And that is actually a couple system. It's a 3D, 2D couple system where the 2D is, a, um, is actually the boundary of this manifold, that is the torus, and is defined by a certain 2D n equal to 2, 0, n equal to 0, 2 uh, theory or boundary condition. So given this setup, um, they consider the, the half index uh, of this uh, theory TM3, and they find it to be the also known as homological block, Z hat of tau. So basically this alpha index, uh, uh, that is the supersymmetric partition functions on this space and with the given boundary condition, can be taken to be uh, a new free manifold invariance, uh, which is also, it's a nice Q-series with integer um, power and integer coefficients up to maybe an overall uh, Q power and coefficient. And that can be, can be thought as graded oral characteristic of certain BPS uh, sector inverse spaces of this 3 d theory. Uh, well, here uh, I actually uh, is the charge under a U1Q notation, where here you uh, argument uh, of Q that is tau is actually describing the rotation uh, um, of a disk once you go around the S1 and J is the U charge of the U1 R symmetry. To define it from a topological point of view, just uh, from the free manifold, uh, we consider a plumbed free manifold. As also then, uh, you might have already uh, heard about this uh, yesterday in Pavel's fund, where a plumbed free manifold is determined by a weighted simple graph where uh, V are the vertices of the graph, edges, and some framing coefficients that are associated to each vertex and will correspond, uh, describe how to make a surgery um, of a link associated to this graph to obtain the free manifolds and free. And in fact, you can think of this graph also has a link where each um, node is, you associate to a, a link and not, and the edge will correspond to chaining uh, to uh, a link. Moreover, uh, this plumbing graph can be equivalently described by an adjacency matrix, uh, where each node uh, um, to which is associated the framing coefficients will correspond to a certain uh, elements on the diagonal of the adjacency matrix, and the off-diagonal uh, will tell you if uh, the nodes are connected or not. M, moreover, induces a non-degenerate non symmetric bilinear pairing on the torsion of H1 of M3 Z. And this, in the case I will consider here, B1 of M3 is zero, so the torsion is basically the co-kernel is the co-kernel of M. Moreover, uh, for the time being, I will restrict to the type of free manifolds that are weakly negative plumbed manifold. And this means that uh, uh, the inverse of adjacency matrix is negative definite when restricted to the SAS space generated by high valency vertices. Uh, so in particular in this graph, the only high valency vertex is V1. Uh, high valency vertex corresponds to vertex of valency um, greater or equal to three. And if restricted to SAS space, this subspace is negative uh, definite. This is needed in order for the definition they gave uh, to give rise to a nice Q series or a nice holomorphic functions in the upper half plane. In fact, a uh, group of Peit Petrovafa um, defined for a weekly, actually for a negative plant free manifold um, and gauge group SUN, but here again I will just focus on SU2, the homological block Z at A of M3 tau that you can see here um, as contour integral. Uh, well, here pi is are, are just the positive eigenvalues of M, sigma is the signature, alpha here framing coefficients. And this integral here 
in the case of what I will consider, I will not even need a principal value, but I will just take the constant term with respect to um, the y's of this integrand expression to obtain what is the homological block. Uh, Q again is equal to by i tau and y uh, is given by e to by i z. Um, the label you can see here is identified with elements of a spin C structure modulo the action of the Val group z2. Moreover, the theta functions oops, is given uh, by this expression uh, and uh, again, boundary conditions are given by uh, spin C and delta V is the degree of the vertex. Here you can see why the condition, the negative condition of M3 arises, otherwise this theta will be uh, divergent. In addition, um, what they showed is that given a homological block, if I take the radial limit, so I take tau towards uh, a root of unity, or sorry, tau towards a rational number, q to a root of unity, and take this particular linear combinations uh, of uh, z hat p, what I obtain turn Simon's position function. Or here, I think uh, the, the linking pairing are all determined by uh, the type of uh, free manifold or plumbing. Uh, what we observed, and this bring one more poor did in 2018, is that the quantum uh, invariant z hat a is actually given by a linear combination of what is called false theta functions, up to possibly a polynomial and uh, an overall Q power. These false theta functions are very similar to theta functions. However, as you can see, instead of summing uh, Q to the um, a certain quadratic form with all positive signs, and start taking plus and minus signs. These objects arise uh, from holomorphic Eichler integral of certain cusp forms. I will explain in the next slide what holomorphic Eichler integrals are. Um, for the moment, let me say that uh, theta one is a cusp form, but it's a unary theta series of weight free half that one can obtain from the Jacobi theta functions, just taking the partial uh, derivative with respect to Z. And uh, as you can see, um, it is this form. Now, the morphic integral of a cusp form can be defined as follows, where gt tau is equal to the free coefficients of the cusp form I started with, and then I take uh, the exponent of q to the one minus weight of the cusp form. So in our case, this would be n to the minus one half q to the n. Thanks to the fact that we have unary theta series with a uh, certain quadratic format the exponent here, not introduced rationality. And I will take back uh, false theta functions once I use as cast for unary theta function. This type of holomorphic Eichler integral arose from the theory of uh, Aishimura and Mani uh, when they're considering a primitive of uh, certain cast form. In fact, for integer weight, they also have an integral representation. Um, that will appear again in a moment. Um, first, let me mention that first false theta function defines onto modular forms when we go towards uh, um, rationals. When tau is taken, we take right limit towards the real time. And this fact, together with the connection between homological blocks and their T invariants, allowed us to uh, retrieve many logical information and free uh, without knowing much about the free manifolds, but just using the property of false theta functions. Now, the fact that the false theta functions define a quantum modular form must tell us that there is uh, the action of a modular group on psi, even though psi uh, is not modular, doesn't have a modular properties, at least not an apparent one. And over, if you remember the definition of quantum forms, uh, I told you that we could have a globally defined function. So starting from a quantum modular form uh, defined on the real line, on the rationals, uh, we have a certain function uh, 
continues to be upper Alps plain, but something even in the lower Alps plain. So till now, I described what C is. It's an allomorphic function in the upper Alps plain, and its radial limit corresponds to some uh, to the WRT invariance on the line. However, I did mention at all what happens in the lower Alps plain. So is there something in the lower Alps plain? And in case what is uh, even topologically. It turns out that related to weekly, uh, Z had a for which deposit dev definite free manifolds. So the oppositely oriented free manifolds. Right. So, well, from the two series, or if you want the turn Simons, perturbative turn Simons, uh, trivial flex connection, we know uh, when we take a that goes to infinity, we have uh, that the turn Simons partition function on minus M3 with level K as, that, as the same asymptotics as the turn Simons on the negatively, weakly negative definite free manifold evaluated in the opposite level, minus K. So in particular here you see how Q and Q imps uh, role. And another condition we have uh, though is not that the asymptotics of two functions agree, as in general, uh, uh, for quantum modular forms when we consider a function on the upper and the lower Earth plane. But in this case of free manifolds invariance, we also expect that it hey, could be a nice solomorphic function with well defined expansions and integral coefficients. So, given these two constraints we have, we want to retrieve. Uh, what is Z at A of minus M3 tau, given the fact that the original definition of Z at A was not, um, was not possible to return a Q series uh, due to the divergence inherited in the functions of the integral of the homological block. So to see what is on the other side, I have to introduce mock modular forms. A mock form f with k is the holomorphic function f. Completion is a modular form that satisfies the function equation. However, this um, function is a holomorphic function doesn't transform uh, in a, as a modular form when I add a certain holomorphic Schiller integral of the cast form in my case, or more generally holomorphic modular form G, I obtain something that transforms uh, modularly. This G is usually called the shadow and is the cast form I need to describe the non-holomorphic Eichler integral that I uh, need to have something that transforms nicely under transformation. Now, mm, as you notice here, what happens to holomorphic integral uh, the correction term that is needed and is equal but opposite to the correction term that is needed for f uh, to have something modular. And is given by this integral that again is a period function like for modular form. So in particular, when I take all that goes to the um, real line, I obtain a quantum modular form uh, G star and the period function on the right side. So to connect to false theta functions, I need to introduce the non-romorphic Schiller integral now in the lower Earth plane. As I told you, the false theta functions and the objects that appear with homological blocks for weakly negative uh, um, Lambda free manifolds are related to G tilde X plus I, uh, G, which I take the right limit towards certain um, rational point X. I get the definition of, I get a quantum modular form. Now, what I'm telling you is that given the normorphic I integral, it's a bit obvious in a sense, um, is the or morphic integral on the other side, uh, I have the same modular form from the other side. So it's leaking the procedure that I was describing at the beginning. To make this formally, you can see that 
um, this special agree to infinite order at any act. So, but we have this asymptotics. However, as I told you, uh, can't um, consider uh, z hat cannot be directly connected to this, which is the normomorphic function and have a nice uh, Q series expansion even in the when I go to the upper half plane. So I have to go back to the initial description of uh, mock functions by illusions. He introduced them in the when he was personalizing them in the 20. He noticed that they have a certain distinctive features. Um, in particular, um, they had infinite number of exponential singularities at roots of unity. What Griffin on Roland and the Choilim Rhodes uh, later showed is that um, actually they proved still Ramanujan uh, uh, state this. Um, noticed that there is a collection of weakly holomorphic modular forms, uh, GJ, such that the F minus the GJ is bounded towards all casts equivalent to XJ. So in particular, if I have given a certain cast, all the one and under your group considering, um, in order to remove a exponential singularity of F, I need to subtract a weakly holomorphic modular forms. And I need a collection of them. One uh, holomorphic modular form will not be enough if I have more inequivalent casts. So given a choice of this weakly holomorphic uh, modular form, uh, what was proven is that F tau, my mock modular form, defines a quantum modular form by this. So taking the subtractions of this weakly holomorphic modular form and the radial limit of this object, we obtain a quantum modular form. And in particular, this is uh, the same, in a sense, quantum modular form that is defined by um, the limit of the holomorphic Eichler integral of the cast form, G. So given a mock modular form whose shadow is a cast form G and G tilde is its Eichler integral, then F and G tilde have the same asymptotic series at X in, in Q. So this is basically what we were looking for and uh, what we conjecture in the um, group of and Harrison is that if the homological block uh, Z hat for a given free manifold is given by a certain linear combinations of host theta function, then the oppositely oriented free manifold is associated with an homological block, which is a linear combinations of mock theta functions. Mock theta functions, that means mock modular forms whose shadow is a unary theta series. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the shadow is actually, uh, and this cast form is what gives rise to the false theta functions, and thus is the shadow of this also mock theta functions. Um, this conjecture showed um, with different procedures. So in particular, we can, as I told you at the beginning, we have uh, a lot of ambiguities when we try to extend the quantum modular form to the upper of lower half plane. In particular, I could add uh, cast forms um, to my mock modular form, and this will have the same shadow marginal mock modular forms, yet will be a different object. How do you define that? We propose a uh, sort of minimum choice. In particular, there are different techniques to get from a to go from a false theta function to a mock modular forms. One of them is through rather marker sums. And that basically um, connects uh, false theta functions to minimal sort of a choice of theta functions that are actually the one also described by Ramanujan. Um, there are also other works on this, and in particular, uh, Guko from Manulesco showed with a different uh, uh, techniques that follows more um, a definition through topology um, that you can get exactly the sum of the mock modular form that we conjecture to have when M3 is a weakly positive definite. And also, Cheng and Broy are also working on this and trying to modify the. Uh, 
definition in order to regularize uh, these uh, theta functions that appear that are not convergent uh, and make sense of the definition of homologic for a weakly positive definite graph. So to summarize, um, given a certain uh, uh, homological blocks associated uh, to a free manifold, I am here and only considering uh, um, ciphered manifolds to free singular fibers. Mm, there are other works for other, uh, higher fibers, and we're also considering uh, uh, higher fibers and higher uh, rank gauge groups. Uh, but here I'm uh, only considering SU2 gauge group and free singular fibers ciphered uh, manifolds. For these cases, Z hat is connected to a linear combinations of false theta functions, which appear as holomorphic Eschler integral of unary theta series, but are also a shadow of certain mock modular forms, which we conjecture to be related with Z hat of opposite oriented free manifold. Particularly when I take the regular of the false theta function, we get the quantum modular form related to the WRT invariant. And for the mock, I will need a certain correction term to again get the quantum modular form and the corresponding WRT invariant. So before concluding, I'll also um, mention the work with Pavel, where we consider homological blocks for uh, supergroups, in particular, uh, here we mentioned the case of SU21 and three manifolds with trivial H1 uh, for homology group in Z. In this case, the hat uh, can be similarly defined, even though, uh, well, here the vile denominator of a super um, of this uh, super leap group appears, and the theta function is now given by an indefinite theta function. Uh, so the integral is not any more as easy as taking a constant term of this integrand expression, but in its uh, definitions of, um, you need to define where uh, this variable are in which chamber at some, uh, to get a, a nice uh, uh, holomorphic functions in the upper half plane. And moreover, the invariant uh, can be shown to be defined only for a minus and inverse, the weakly co-positive. Where these conditions arise from the fact that you want um, the invariance also uh, to be invariant for different uh, um, when you apply Kirby moves on a certain uh, plumbing graph, you know you get uh, homomorphic free manifolds that are described differently well, by different plumbing graph. There is a certain redundancy. You have to get rid of if you want to get a certain uh, topological invariant. And what we observe is that uh, for the homological block associated to free sphere, to the S3, uh, there is a single one, uh, and you have this, action, this nice Q series associated to it, where the n is the number of positive integer divisors and is in fact related to the weight one holomorphic Eisenstein series, E1 tau. These objects have been analyzed by um, mainly Bettin and Conray, but also Lewis and Zagier in 2010. And in fact, they describe other types, again, strong quantum modular forms, where if I take the radial limit of E1 tau minus the modular transformed Eisenstein series, I again obtain a period function, which has some nicer analytic property than the functions I'm started with. That is the Eisenstein series. And in particular, in this case, it extends to an analytic function of the slit complex plane. Unfortunately, for this case of uh, uh, supergroups, in the case of uh, mm, more general free manifolds, like already brisk or homology spheres, at the moment we haven't been able uh, uh, to see yet the uh, quantum modularity. Uh, but they're much more complicated objects and the number theoretical uh, literature is uh, much smaller in these cases. So let me conclude um, by mentioning um, the fact that for free manifolds in parents, there have been many works on different type uh, 
always homological blocks, but for higher rank age groups, more complicated free manifolds. And there, it has been noticed that the connections between and logarithmic vertex operator algebra, in particular singlet uh, VOAs, with um, Z hat for the case of SU2 gauge groups and ciphered uh, free manifolds with three singular fibers. In the case of homological blocks or subgroups, there are too many questions uh, open. And uh, well, I say probably even uh, not only for uh, supergroups. But um, one interesting fact is that uh, apart from the quantum modularity I described you, um, there are also other types of uh, free manifold invariants, for instance, Kashaev invariants, um, Color Jones polynomial. Um, that are related to, to quantum modular forms. So in a sense, they appear to be natural in the, this context of low dimensional topology. They turn out useful to describe topological information and how they hint the hidden model structure. In, uh, for instance, for the case of post theta functions, we can see this explicitly. But given the definition of quantum forms, what I also wonder is, is there a place where we can find our quantum modular forms? Are they only natural from the free manifold point of view or are they much more um, common objects than what we know at the moment? So I stop and thank you for the attention. Thank you, Francesca. Thanks so much for the excellent talk. I'm going to unmute everyone um, and let's uh, give a Big hand to our speaker. Now, uh, let's uh, this is the time for questions. So I see um, there's a question from Edward Witten. My, my question is mainly does positivity of the three manifold mean something in terms of geometry, like positive scalar curvature or Ricci tensor or something? You have to unmute your, unmute. Francesca, you're unmute. muted. You need to unmute. Francesca, uh, you need to unmute. We can't hear you, Francesca. Can you unmute? Uh, there's a, I send you an uh, unmute request. Thanks. Yes, yeah, okay. I was looking for that. Um, no, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, for instance, the, uh, the examples we consider of the uh, site of free manifolds, um, they, Basically, one, uh, I mean, uh, um, the positively oriented free manifolds are, are given by um, the same plumbing graph with opposite framing coefficients. Uh, and this gives a kind of a, a negativity or positivity condition. But, um, so it's but true that positive or negative manifolds have positive or negative curvature. Mm -hmm. What kind of, I might be completely on the wrong track, but when I hear your talk, you have an invariant that's defined with the rational points on the real line. Which it's defined when Q is the root of unity. And then you're trying to continue it away from the values of Q where it's originally defined. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would just give a holomorphic function of Q, maybe, or who knows where its singularities would be. But mm -hmm. you seem to be in a setting where there are two different continuations. One is holomorphic in the upper half plane, one's holomorphic in the lower half plane. Is that yeah. the Basically, yeah, yeah. Basically, um, you have a certain functions that, uh, let's say, uh, 
you take a certain function holomorphic in the upper half plane. In this case, what happens is, for instance, if I have a certain Q upper geometric series expression of the solution, formally Q but Q in and we expand it in the a different in the upper half plane. In that case, I in this case as I described here, I get two different functions. This one, for instance, a false theta function and another mock theta function. Um, so do you that's the side is functions have the same value when Q is a root of unity? Yes. In the Should we, uh, there is another uh, question uh, by Mikola Yedishchenko. Can, can read the question? Me also, just the, uh, the last question by Whitman. Um, oh, sorry. One thing is, um, okay, this, this idea of um, continuing, let's say, but you cannot continue because both things, uh, functions have natural boundaries on the real line. Uh, but the idea of flicking on the other side uh, can, goes even back to the marker where he was considering uh, a marker for and trying to see what happens to the asymptotic uh, expressions of his smaller forms if I try to define it on the other side uh, for Q as opposed to Q index. And if you depending on how you go, uh, you can use different techniques to go on the other side. You might even get a zero on the lower half plane. So in particular with the marker sums, you will have you, you will have a modular form defined on one side of the plane and an expansion of zero on the other side. Um, I don't know if this helps, but it's uh, it just this thing. Thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> there is another question uh, from Nicola Derishenko. I'm going to read the question. So can you state what is the class of three manifolds for which this modularity story works? So uh, the, the mock false conjecture has been uh, based only for uh, three singular fibers uh, cyclic manifolds. Now, uh, depending on what you mean by the modularity story, in the sense, uh, it depends a bit. Uh, if I increase the number of uh, fibers, I will still obtain, uh, for instance, for four singular fibers, I'll still obtain some type of uh, false theta function, but now I'll have different weights. Not only the one I have here, but multiple false theta functions uh, associated with shadows of different weights. And if you increase the, oh, well, you're only asking what's the class of three. Then there are other works, for instance, a paper um, by um, Chung, Bukov, Sopengo, Park. Uh, they also describe the uh, minus one toric manifold. And in that case as well, uh, false theta functions uh, appear. Uh, so there might be uh, also the other side of the story. Mm. Or is there any other question? Uh, there is a question from Ali Shepper. You can I send you the unmute because can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Uh, can I ask about the, um, the the relation of this modularity story with the uh, with the logarithm? VOAs that you mentioned on this uh, slide. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, for example, what are some hints uh, towards this connection uh, that you could give? Uh, yeah, so we're working on it uh, now with uh, um, Chang, uh, Chung, uh, um, group of uh, Harrison and uh, Boris Fagin. And so what we already noticed in the previous paper is that um, in the case, again, of ciphered three manifolds with three singular fibers, um, the logical block 
related with the characters of uh, singlet logarithm of one p um, boa, and moreover, there's also connections for for star five, uh, where you actually have p p prime uh, logarithm of boa singlet. Uh, there seems to be a connection to triplet well uh, from the ground, but we're still. Uh, uh, trying to understand how far this connection goes. So for which type of uh, three methods and so on. Uh, are there any other questions? I think there are, there's, uh, if there are no further questions, then I want to thank the speaker one more time uh, for this excellent talk. And uh, this is actually the end of our first session. And I want to thank all the speakers uh, for their nice talks and uh, everyone for this engaging participation. And now I'm handing over to Jeff. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Shadid. I've, Sylvia, I've made you co-host. Hi, hi, thanks. I have a simple question. How do I see, um, how do I, I mute people? Maybe when I become a co-host, I understand. You, you're co-host um, at the moment. Um, if you look at the... the oh, yes, yes, oh, yes, yes. I understand, understand. Okay, good. I found it. And the same uh, when uh, people ask questions, I should see their hand. They, That's uh, right. So uh, Zoom will Zoom floats people to the top um, okay. as they are, as they raise okay. their hand. Okay. Perfect. Zoom Thanks. Uh, I just want to see if Yang Li. Uh, is around. And I will make him co-host as well. Yeah, hello. Hi. Ah, good. Excellent. Very good. Uh, so we have about, we have about twelve minutes to the next uh, to the next session. Um, so maybe um, uh, Yang Hui, do you want to see if you're if everything? Works. You want to share your screen? Just make sure everything's yeah, going. Yeah, sure. Just yeah. Um. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> um. Right. Excellent. That's all right. Now we're trying to. How do I move this aside? Yeah, I guess I could just move this aside. Uh, we can see your your screen now as as a presentation. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So so we have about. Uh, but ne nearly ten minutes before the next session. Really? Starts. Okay, I can get a get a coffee or something. Yep. All right. <laughs>